and welcome back to Book and Page. I am just loving the sunlight right now, though the camera probably not so much, especially with me in orange. Give me a second. That should be a little better for you folks. Okay, welcome back. We are on to video number two for Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale. And for this video, we are doing Act 2, Scenes 1 and 2. Scene 1 is a little longer, Scene 2 a little shorter, but we're getting some development in our plot. So let's quickly refresh on what happened during those scenes, and then talk about things in a little more depth. So, Act 2, Scene 1. <laughs> we are back out in the garden with Hermione and Mamilius, her son along with a couple of ladies in attendance. Now Hermione, who we're now told is actually pregnant with her second child, needs a bit of a break from her son and wants to take a walk by herself. So she leaves him in attendance with some ladies. Now, Mamilius doesn't really want to play because he's a big boy now and wants to be treated as such. So there's a little mm, banter with the ladies and eventually they say, ah, when you have your brother, and we play with him, you're gonna want to play with us, but whatever, whatever, it's fine, it's fine. And Hermione comes back in. Turns out, real short walk, she's ready to deal with her son again. And actually invites him to tell her a story. They just sit down to do so when Leonis enters again with his gentleman. It turns out that Polinus and, of course, Carmelo have fled the country, and that confirms everything Leonis thought he knew. So, obviously, time to arrest his wife! He does at least send their son out first, so the kid's not watching this happen, saying that while he sees a little bit of himself in the kid, he certainly is much more his mother's child, and that's a problem. But the second child, not so much. Obviously, that's Polonus's child, and Hermione is now arrested. She bids her ladies not to weep for her because she's innocent and is taken off to some sort of tower. I always picture the Tower of London, but we're certainly not in England right now. Especially not since, it turns out, Leonis is waiting for word from the Oracle of Delphi. Yes, all his lords are insistent that Hermione is innocent, there's no way she's sleeping around, and they'll even put their own lives and the lives of their family on the line to prove this. Leonis is not listening, except for the fact that he's waiting for the Oracle's word. She's still arrested, though, so that she doesn't sleep around like the horror that she is while he's waiting. Thanks. So, Act 2, Scene 2 actually jumps to this prison and we meet Paulina. Paulina is actually the wife of one of said gentlemen from earlier, and she's here to talk with the queen. The jailer, though, says no one gets to talk with the queen, and Paulina admits, okay, that's fine, can I talk to one of her ladies? Perhaps Amelia. The jailer consents to this, and Amelia is brought up to discuss how the queen is doing. The important information is the queen has now had her child a little premature, probably from the stress of it all, and it's not a boy, it is a little girl. Paulina says, well, jail's not a really great place to raise a kid. If the queen consents, why don't I take her? Amelia says this is a good idea and goes in to speak with the queen, but the jailer is a little unsure. Paulina does reassure him that she will stand between him and any consequences that might arise, and we get some agreement, though we don't see any kid exchanged at this point as we end the scene. Yeah, we went from accusations to arresting the queen. Like I said last video, Leontus has this image in his head and a storyline he's telling himself about Hermione and Paulinus sleeping together. And no matter what they do, that was never going to get disproven. Him insisting that Hermione should ask Paulinus to stay and go walking in the garden for him, her consent to do both and his consent to do both proves exactly what's happening. But in fact, this continuing scene, while well, it shows, like I said, he's believing it either way. 
no matter their actions right now, everything is going to prove that these two people are sleeping together. The fact that Polinus fled, obviously his shows his sign of guilt. Not so much the fear of dying. Hermione insisting that uh, she's innocent? Of course she would. She's been caught cuckolding the king. It's one of those awkward things where unfortunately nobody is winning this argument. And it kind of shows how well-loved Hermione is that the gentlemen here are defending her. Oftentimes with plays like this, you do have a gentleman off to the side who's whispering in the king's ear to show him that uh, everybody's against him. In fact, a lot of your famous villains are in fact this type of person at the beginning. Richard III, before he becomes king, is precisely the guy who's saying he's a friend and just wants the king to know what people are doing behind his back. The gentleman actually called this trope out again. There is precisely a gentleman who says, I want you to tell me who is telling you these things so I can fight the dude. Now, part of it has to be an assumption, of course, that the king isn't this badly mistaken on his own. There has to be somebody misleading him. And part of that is the body politic coming back in. Now, this is oft discussed in academia, but it might not be something everybody's heard before. It's really actually an important image for practically every Shakespearean play. The body pol polita is always going to come into play. So the body politic is actually the idea that a community serves as a human body. That is to say the head of the body, so where all the leadership comes from, is the king. The limbs are usually the higher up people, the nobility and knights, who are going to follow the king's orders, just like my brain commands my arms and legs to do things, including hit people. And the rest of the body, the chest, lungs, and all of the organs, of course, are the lower end of society, the ones that you need to keep functioning. For example, the farmers could be attributed to the stomach of the body polit politic, precisely because they provide the food that keeps the community living. Now, when you look at a community like this, especially in a Shakespearean play, when the king is often the focus, and the king is either misled, evil, or, well, delusional, something's wrong with the head of the community. The fact is that these gentlemen are insisting that the queen is guiltless, but somehow the king is also as well, precisely because he's the head of the community. That says that there's something wrong with the community in and of itself, if Leontis can make this mistake about Hermione without being misled. Now, if somebody else is talking him into it, then that's a smaller problem, like a disease of the body, that you can actually get rid of. But, if it's a problem with the head itself, most people will tell you mental illness doesn't go away that quickly. And the leader of the community needs to be in control. If he is making these mistakes about his own wife, somebody he should trust deeply and implicitly, then what type of mistakes is he going to make with the rest of the community? If he is so suspicious of everybody else, this is the type of head that's going to start cutting off his own limbs. And that's a major concern that we're actually seeing play out very quickly. First and foremost, the king still has some suspicion of his son, Mamilius. Now, he does state that he's relatively sure Mamilius is in fact his own child. He says that there is some of his blood in it, but he's also much more of his mother's son. And this is actually a confirmation of Mamilius defending himself in a lot of ways in Act 1. Mamilius does say that I am your son. People say I'm like you. And Leontus is at least accepting that. But the other child in this relationship is going to be a limb that's going to get cut off. Especially once it's revealed that the child is a girl. Suddenly we don't have the heir and the spare, we have the heir and a girl who might kind of be useful, except I'm pretty sure she's not my kid. 
A girl who could normally be married off for political reasons suddenly actually becomes a liability if, in fact, Hermione and Paulinus are sleeping together. Suddenly we don't have a political ally for Leontis, but possibly an ally for a close friend who is now become an enemy in his head. The fact is, everybody is fighting to make it so that Leontis is both wrong and right in this situation, precisely because no one wants the king to be so wrong that he's killing off his own family members, or at least threatening to. Now thankfully, Leontis does seem to have some sort of connecting point here. There is actually a certain set of levels of people better believed in courts of law. And this is why a lot of people don't like medieval courts of law. If you are very low on the totem pole, nobody's listening to you. The king, of course, is believed at the highest, for the king's word is law. Lords and nobles go next. And then there's some debate whether there's ladies or knights that come next. But ultimately, we then get the male rest of the community and the female rest of the community at the end. So while a lady's word might be taken above, say, a commoner's, she's not going to win against the king. And Leontis actually acknowledges this. When all his lords are standing up to him saying it couldn't possibly be the way he thinks it is, Leontis says, is my word not meaningful? And everyone kind of has to shut up after that point. But there is somebody who will be taken more seriously than even the king, and that is some sort of divine intervention here. So the Oracle of Delphi is precisely what's needed. But you always, always have to keep in mind that oracles and prophecies in general are often going to be very vague. They could be self-fulfilling, or the Oracle of Delphi could give an answer that's so cryptic that you might interpret it to mean one thing, and it could, in fact, mean another. When we say that we're going to overthrow the king, which king are we talking about? When the Oracle of Delphi says victory will come to the righteous, well, you're going to take that to mean I'm in the righteous position, so victory will be mine. And it turns out, whoops, nope, your enemy was right the entire time. What we're seeing is a flawed system, very, very flawed, but at least we're giving Hermione a chance here. If Leontis had his way, she'd be probably kicking the bucket pretty quick, including the little baby girl. Can we blame Carmillo for making the move that he did? We, if we remember correctly, Carmillo, in the first act, agreed to the plan to kill Paulinus so that Leontis would agree to take Hermione back for the kid's sake. But at this point in time, maybe Carmillo understood the truth that Leontis was never going to take Hermione back because there was always going to be this suspicion that she was sleeping around. So was Carmillo trying to save somebody at least? and chose to save Paulinus over Hermione? Or is there a hope that the Oracle of Delphi is going to interfere here and will be able to save both groups? Ultimately, we're actually starting to see the body politic falling apart. There is something wrong with the king, and the brain's no longer taking in the messages the rest of the body is sending. This is a very deep concern that we're going to see go sideways very quickly. We kind of start to see that in scene two, where Hermione has actually had her baby while still in jail, and evidently no one on the king's side has, you know, thought about the health of the child. It takes another wife, Paulina, stepping in here to come and help this kid. It almost seems like no one outside the jail is even aware Hermione's had the baby, precisely because the baby is early. And Leonis probably doesn't care because he's still pretty sure it's not his kid. Paulina coming in, well, she's a question at this point in time. Is she here as a positive figure or a negative one? 
are we seeing two women who are seeing their equality? Are they seeing themselves as women who need to help and protect each other because sometimes the men in their lives are out to get them? Is Paulina there precisely to help the queen and her child? Or are we seeing, well, Eve, who's going to ultimately lead to the fall? Are we seeing the type of woman that is a maternal figure? Or as a seductress, who's now seeing the queen out of the way? Paulina coming in here is precisely a wild card, especially once she's about to be handed a royal child. I hate to say it, but Richard III's one of the more popular Shakespearean plays. Kids in a tower going missing is a major concern, and all of us should be a little suspicious. We're not quite sure what's going on here. What side is Paulina playing? What side is Hermione going to play? What is Leonis's plan? What I really love about this set of scenes is it sets up what we are to be expecting. You see, A Winter's Tale doesn't quite fit into any of the three divided categories for, well, Shakespeare. We're not looking at a history here. Not unless Midsummer Night's Dream is considered a history. Are we looking at a comedy or a tragedy? Well, we're going to see by the end again that neither of those quite fit. But Act 2, Scene 1, tells us what type of story we should be expecting. When we hit Act 1, Scene 2, and Leontis just goes nuts with the my wife sleeping around, it's suddenly a question for us. Is this going to be a tragic bodies littering the stage story? Or are we expecting a wacky comedy with people running around to spy on the queen and hijinks? Well, Amelius tells us. Hermione invites her son to tell her a story, make it as happy or as sad as he wants, though he would love if she would get to hear a happy story. Despite the queen wanting to hear a happy story, Mamilius says that sad stories are more appropriate for the winter. Mamilius tells us the winter's tale is going to be sad. Is it going to be a tragedy? With, like I said, bodies littering the stage? Well, we're just going to have to read to find out. But our expectations are sent the moment Mamilius says that winter is for sadness. And Hermione is arrested. Because the body politic, well, it's gone a little nuts. So, I'm going to keep reading, and I hope you do too. See you next time.